What makes us special? What makes humans unique? What is the greatest thing that we, as a species, have achieved? If you ask me, the answer is science. Science allows us to constantly improve our quality of life. It gives us a better understanding of our bodies and brains, a better health. It gives us technological advances on a daily basis. Science allows us to recognize short and long-term threats on the environment and keep ourselves safe. And now, as our numbers are growing and the challenges that we face are growing with it, we need science more than ever. But here's the bad news. We are not doing science as well as we can. We are not pushing the boundaries of our knowledge as hard as we can. We are not improving our quality of life as fast as we can. Because the fact is, we are not always giving the best and the brightest scientists a chance to excel. We think we are. If I ask you what does a scientist need to succeed in his or her career, the answer that comes to mind is intellectual aptitude. A scientist needs to be smart. If you are a genius, your papers will be published. If you are brilliant, you will succeed. But it's actually not that simple. Because if you are a woman in science, your brilliance will not be as readily acknowledged as that of your male peers. When I was a little girl, I spent my summers lying on the grass, staring up at the night sky and just marveling at the universe. My dad had told me that the universe was infinite, so, of course, I wondered what would happen if I crossed over to infinity, which was not the most sensible question in hindsight. I thought about black holes and I wondered about wormholes, and I had all these questions about space, and I wanted answers. Then later on in high school, I turned out to be pretty good at physics. But even girls who excel at the natural sciences do not always consider it to be a valid career option. Because we're constantly told by our friends, our parents, our teachers, or maybe even just the TV, that science is a boy's thing. At 15, I was one of those girls, and I considered dropping the subject of physics. But I was one of the lucky ones. Because my physics teacher found out, and he knew that I liked physics, and he knew that I was good at physics, so he asked me what the heck I was doing. And that simple question changed my life, because he was right. I really did enjoy physics, and I really was pretty good at it, so why did I not consider it to be my future? I continued doing the subject, and a couple of years later, I enrolled to university as an astrophysics student, which is still one of the best decisions of my life. But my time at university wasn't always smooth sailing. In fact, something really bothered me about being one of the very few girls in my physics classes. I was really scared of saying something stupid. I was scared of asking a silly question. What if everybody else there already knew the answer? And I'm sure that many of us have felt that way, right? But my fear came with an extra punch. I was scared that if I said something stupid, my classmates wouldn't just think that I wasn't very good at physics. They would think that girls weren't that good at physics. It wasn't just my reputation that was at stake. Do take a moment to realize that in some of those classes, I was a sole representative, sole representative of half of the world population. That's a pretty big burden to bear for an 18-year-old. And this matters because it wasn't just in my mind. It's also the world that we live in. Women in science do get underestimated. Consider, for instance, a study that was done in undergraduate biology classrooms. Researchers asked students from these classes to name another student who they thought performed well in class. And as it turned out, male students would often select another male student, even though there were equally or even better performing women in those classes. So men simply got better performance reviews. Women did get underestimated. And this bias continues to exist for every step of a scientist's career. A study that was done by Yale scientists focused on resumes. These scientists created a resume that belonged to a student 
who was applying for a laboratory manager position. And these scientists sent the resumes out to over 100 professors, and they asked them to evaluate the candidate. Now, half of the resumes had the name John at the top of the page, and the other half was the exact same resume, but with the name Jennifer at the top of the page. These professors rated John to be more competent, more qualified, and they offered John a 15% higher salary than Jennifer. And even if you've made it as a woman in science and you are authoring papers by the dozen, that bias is still going to be working against you. A global study found that papers that are authored by women are less likely to be cited by other scientists. And this is not about the content of the paper. There's nothing inherently different about the quality of the work. It's just the fact that a female name at the top of the page will call, cause peers to think that the quality of that paper is less than a paper that is authored by men. And since citations often play a very central role in the evaluation of scientists, this can actually impact women's careers tremendously. Now, to be clear, I may be talking about gender today, but similar studies have been done to detect a bias against people of color. So this argument sadly stands for every minority in science. Now, I work with scientists every day, and whenever this subject comes up, there's always somebody who will react defensively. And that person will say, we do not look at gender, we look at the quality of a person's work. And we should look at the quality of a person's work, because if we would do anything but that, we would actually be harming science. And I completely agree. We should be looking at the quality of a person's work. But as the studies I mentioned point out, that is not what we're doing. Implying that we are, or even implying that we're able to, just goes to show that people don't know how implicit bias works. Of course, it's understandably difficult to get scientists to realize that they are unable to be objective. It's a scientist's core business to analyze the data, to analyze the facts, and to reach an objective conclusion. So it's jarring, to say the least, when somebody tells you that you're actually unable to be objective. I understand why people are resistant to that idea. But the studies have been done, the numbers have been crunched, the results are in, and if there's anything that scientists should respect, it's data. So we need to step up and do better. For us, for humanity, to keep pushing, we need to maximize our intellectual capital. We simply can't ignore the intellectual contributions of half of the world's population and still expect the best results. Just take a moment to realize how absurd that idea is. If we want to keep pushing, if we want to face the challenges that are coming our way, we need to make sure that the doors of our labs are wide open to everyone. Science needs diversity. And if we do manage to get a more diverse workforce, there's actually an additional advantage waiting for us. Studies have shown that more diverse teams are actually more creative. They come up with more innovative ideas, more technological advances. And the reason for this is really simple. In a diverse team, you will be confronted with a lot of different perspectives. So you will be forced to think harder. You will be forced to reconsider what you think you know. And these teams are actually better at solving problems. So striving to increase workplace diversity is not something that we should just be doing for karma points. It's also the smart thing to do. So science needs diversity. But what can we do? What I believe the problem boils down to is actually about the image that we have in our minds of what a scientist is. If I ask you to picture a scientist, you are most likely to picture a white older male. We need to change that. We need to make sure that minorities can consider science to be a valid career option. We need to make sure that all children can look up to scientists and see their future selves. And we need to make sure that scientists can look at their female colleagues, see legitimate scientists, and judge them accordingly. So what can we do? 
I believe that all of us can contribute to making this difference because even the smallest steps matter. So, for instance, buy your niece a toy telescope. Buy your science kit. If your daughter wants to throw a birthday party, consider hosting it at a science museum. Have your kids, boys and girls, talk to female scientists. If you are a female scientist, share your work on social media. Show the world what a scientist looks like. And if your 15-year-old daughter considers dropping the subject of physics that she's so good at, point her in my direction. <laughs> Because if we can make science for everyone, we can finally know what it's like to push the boundaries of human knowledge without letting anything hold us back. Thank you. Thank you.